Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Up front this week, more than 400 colleges and universities are requiring students to get the COVID-19 vaccine to attend in-person classes this fall. Most colleges already require students to be vaccinated against diseases like measles, mumps, and rubella. And so some argue the COVID-19 vaccine should be no different. But lawsuits and some state lawmakers around the country say not so fast. They argue the COVID-19 vaccine cannot be mandatory until regular authorization. When we recorded this program in early June, the vaccines were approved for emergency use. New Mexico State University in Las Cruces says it's not planning to require inoculation, but it's strongly encouraging students, staff and faculty to be vaccinated. Here's KRWG public media scholar Sarah Rodriguez. Universities all over the United States are requiring students to receive COVID-19 vaccinations as campuses return to in-person instruction this fall. In an April 6th President's Town Hall, New Mexico State University Executive Director of Health and Wellness, Lori McKee, stated that NMSU will not be requiring students and faculty to receive or show proof of vaccination. So no, the vaccine is currently under emergency use authorization, which means um, it's only been approved for emergency use. So at this point, there is no entity that can truly require you to be vaccinated, and NMSU is one of those but we do strongly encourage. NMSU President Dr. John Floros states that NMSU is strongly encouraging students and faculty to receive the vaccine as the campus prepares for a conventional fall semester. We have been very straightforward and very clear from the get-go uh, that not only we encourage people to get vaccinated, but we would like everybody to get vaccinated. This is the way that we can come back in a safe way particularly within our campus, within our system, within our community. In a poll conducted by the Office of the President, 93% of NMSU faculty and students claimed that they wanted to receive the vaccine, were strongly considering receiving the vaccine, or have already received it. Only 7% of you said, no, we're not going to take the vaccine. I would very much like to make that 7% even smaller, maybe five, maybe two but we can't force everybody to, to get vaccinated. We know that not everybody can get vaccinated, but we're gonna do our best to encourage and to really guide all of you to, to get vaccinated now that the vaccines are widely available. NMSU's Aggie Health and Wellness Center has been approved as a vaccine distribution site. McKee says this provides more resources for students and faculty to receive the vaccine. There's many opportunities. So if you want a vaccination, sign up, and you will get one. We will be advertising more going through clinics during the summer as freshmen come to campus. If they've already been enrolled, we hope to have opportunities where they can make appointments to get vaccinated if they haven't done so in their home communities. NMSU freshman Kayla Wilson says the COVID vaccine should be required for students on campus. I do think that students should be required to get the vaccine because you know, all of those students that aren't vaccinated would still be at really high risks of getting COVID. And that would mean that the campus doesn't have herd immunity. So that could mean like COVID could be more widely spread if not everyone is vaccinated. NMSU student Grace Gossett also says the vaccine should be required in the future. As kids, we had to get vaccinated to go to school. And so I think the same should apply for the COVID-19 shot. At some point in the future, it should be required because it is such a deadly virus and it spreads very, very quickly. Gossett says vaccinations will lead to a safer campus for students and faculty. It helps us stay healthy and it'll help minimize the spread of the virus. And I think that's the most important, especially um, with the faculty and just mainly the students on campus. And it helps us get back to normal. The COVID vaccine is available in New Mexico for everyone ages 16 and up. 
register at cvvaccine.nmhealth.org and find a vaccine site near you. For KRWG Public Media, I'm Sarah Rodriguez. After this story was produced, the Pfizer vaccine was approved for everyone 12 years old and up. New Mexico residents may register at vaccinenm.org. Once you do get your first shot, New Mexico residents may sign up for a chance to win up to $5 million in prizes. That website is vax2themaxnm.org. In focus on newsmakers this week, the fight against childhood malnutrition. It's the subject of a new book, Within Our Grasp, Childhood Malnutrition Worldwide and the Revolution Taking Place to End It. And joining me is author Sharman F. Russell of Silver City. She's a professor emeritus at New Me Western New Mexico University. Sharman, thank you for being here. I wanna start with a statistic uh, that may surprise some people who are watching the show today. Your book notes that nearly one in four children worldwide are stunted physically and mentally due to lack of food or nutrients. Give us a sense of, of this problem and why it's so common. Okay, okay, thank you. Well, when you look at, when we look at images on the media of famine, of, of hungry children, we see those skeletal children, their eyes too bright, those protruding ribs. Uh, we're looking at severe childhood malnutrition and it's called wasting. And, and we are looking at a body that's cannibalizing itself, that's using every bit of its fat reserves, its muscles, its vitamins, struggling to survive. And without help, that child will die. And we actually think about 7% of children in the world are wasted or some form on the continuum of that. They're too thin for their, for their height, for their age. But a much more prevalent form of childhood malnutrition, as you say, nearly one quarter of, of our children in the world are a form of malnutrition we call stunting. And stunting can start in the womb and it uh, usually happens in the first years of life. And it is also a faltering of growth uh, because of a lack of food and nutrients. So most of us, most humans follow the same growth patterns in the first five years of life. Your, your genetic potential, what makes one person short and one person tall, kicks in later in childhood. And that's why the World Health Organization can actually measure if a child under the age of five, if, the, if his or her growth is faltering, if she's too thin, for, I'm sorry, too short for her age. Such so what important. Yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, yeah. Go ahead, so, I, I, I knew you had more to say. <laughs> right, if you're too short for your age, but what's important to understand is that this is shorthand for this range of physical and mental and emotional problems. Um, if you're stunted, it's not reversible. A stunted one-year-old becomes a stunted 10-year-old, becomes a stunted adult. And uh, as a child, you might have uh, cognitive problems. Uh, you'll do less well in school. You might have emotional problems. Uh, you're, you might get sick more often because you'll have immune problems. So not getting those nutrients, vitamins and minerals and calories too, just food, in that time of life when you're brain and your body is developing so quickly, that will affect you your entire life. As an yeah. adult, you'll be at greater risk for so many different diseases. Good reason for us to start with this topic and as well, uh, the fact that you, you may not realize that a child is malnourished because they may have normal a normal weight uh, or even perhaps be uh, above a normal weight, but they aren't getting the right nutrients, the right types of, of food, so they're malnourished. Give us an idea of some of the differences and similarities between childhood malnutrition in a wealthy country like America, uh, as opposed to a poor country like Malawi in Africa, uh, where much of your book ta ta takes place. 
Yeah, right, right. Well, there are some similarities. You know, it's a little surprising that we would have any kind of vitamin mineral deficiency, but actually the CDC estimates that 15% of pregnant women in America have an iron deficiency and 15% of toddlers in America have an iron deficiency. And that's really important because iron is so connected to neurological development. So, so we do have some of that. Um, we have food insecurity. Uh, there are, especially during the pandemic uh, in New Mexico, they estimated that one out of three children might live in a household that's food insecure. And that's when you just don't know when your next meal when will be. You know, so it's, it's an emotional uh, as well as a physical, uh, you know, sense of, of, of harm, the harm is being done. But in America, the most prevalent form of childhood malnutrition we have is overweight, being obese or overweight under the age of five. And that will, of course, cause all kinds of problems later on as an adult. But this isn't really just an American problem. The majority of uh, children who are overweight actually live in Africa uh, and live in parts of Asia. Interesting. A along with this uh, very difficult challenge uh, for the nation, for the entire world, we have some hope. The subtitle of your book gives us hope. Childhood malnutrition worldwide and the revolution taking place to end it. Let's talk about the revolution that you're referring to here. Yes, yes. You know, I've talked about those searing images on, on TV about wasted children. I've talked about the, the lack of um, of this diminishment that a child, a child would have being stunted. The numbers become huge. There are things we can't really uh, absorb. 150 million stunted children, 50 million wasted children. I would never be able to write about this if there wasn't hope. Um, I wouldn't be able to spend time with this subject if there wasn't not only hope, but there's uh, lots of inspiration. There's, I've met so many people working to end this problem in the world. And there's a certain wonder too, because when you explore dysfunction, malnourishment, it, you have to learn about function. You have to learn about kind of the miracle of the body of how, of how we turn you know, food and nutrients into who we are. So the hope is, um, it, it, the revolution is how much better we understand how to treat childhood malnutrition, how much better we understand uh, the role of vitamins and minerals in the body. We used to actually, uh, in the late 90s, uh, diagnose a child with severe malnutrition, put them in a hospital, give them the best care, and half of them would die. We were feeding them the wrong kinds of food. We were feeding them too much food and we were exposing them to disease. So since then, we've come up with something called ready to use therapeutic food. It's kind of a food medicine it is absolutely what the child needs in terms of vitamins and minerals and calories. It's in this foil packet that doesn't need refrigeration. It doesn't need water. And because of that, you can send it home. We send these very sick children home to be cared for by their mothers and fathers at home. And almost all of them survive. So that was a breakthrough. That was a revolution. And as we learned about that, as we learned how to treat these sick children and really what was happening in our bodies, we learned the importance of women, that, that if we didn't empower women, we weren't gonna deal with this problem. We learned about the importance of sanitation. We learned about the connection of disease and childhood malnutrition. We became you know, much more smart about sustainable agriculture, about economics. So we have this holistic approach now. We really do know what to do. We don't have to research this too much more. Yeah. We just have to do it. Yeah, and let me drill down a bit more on that uh, topic of empowering women. You say that that is a key to ending childhood malnutrition. What does it look like? Yeah, that's, that's a wonderful question. So as you say, most of this book took place uh, in Malawi, which I went to visit because I knew they had many successful programs of childhood malnutrition, and they also have quite a bit of childhood malnutrition. Um, so Malawi is one of the poorest countries in the world. 80% are smallholder farmers. 80% uh, of those don't have running water or electricity. 
And, and this isn't that uncommon around the world. Uh, so I went to a program that wanted to improve childhood malnutrition by increasing the prosperity of the farmers. That would make sense if you have more money. So the, one of the things they did was uh, hand out a lot of new crops. Uh, Malawians were mostly planting maize, but this program was saying, well, here's plant soybean and plant pigeon peas and plant cow peas, you know, giving them legumes, showing them new agricultural techniques, showing them how to use compost uh, fertilizer instead of synthetic fertilizer that they had to buy. So all these good things they were doing. And then they checked in a few years. Uh, how was that affecting childhood malnutrition? But it turns out you can make a household more prosperous. This can be in the city or the country. But if that prosperity doesn't reach the women in the household, it's not going to reach the children in the household. Mm. It has to be shared equally in the family. That's what they learned. And so empowerment of women starts at that level in the family. The other thing that the women in this program were, were telling them, they said, you know, we're responsible for all the child care uh, and you want us to breastfeed exclusively for six months. And, and that's hard work. <laughs> we're responsible for all the cooking and cleaning and we have to carry water a half a mile, you know, from a well. It's very hard to do without running water and electricity. We're responsible for um, all the cooking. And yet we also have about half the chores of farming we're exhausted you know so the, around the world this is not uncommon that women work very very hard yeah. so the program said oh well what can we do about that how can we empower you so they started having these wonderful community theaters where men and women were talking to each other about sharing household uh chores and sharing child care uh sharing cooking um they would have cooking days where the you know the men would come and there'd be contests and they would do relishes and it was education and and it was about empowering the woman in the household so important, and uh, no doubt you've heard the stories that uh, in uh, our much more uh, developed country where you have uh, two people in a household very often who work outside the home uh, during the pandemic. We've heard uh, so many uh, stories and some uh, research that's been shared on the fact that uh, women say, look, uh, I'm home and I'm, I'm working remotely, but now I'm also doing much more in terms of childcare and I'm not getting the help uh, from my partner uh, in the household. Uh, it's not split evenly. So we also see this problem in, in the United States and the pandemic has put a focus on it. I know it's such an echo of what we know in in uh, other countries, too. I, I would be remiss not to say at the meta level, uh, supporting education for women, supporting job employment for women, supporting uh, property rights for women, supporting uh, protections from domestic violence and abuse. So there's that social level that that has to you know we have to do that too yeah um but but even then um it still has to happen at the family household level yeah you also focus on private enterprise as playing an important role in ending childhood malnutrition tell me about that i do i do because so many of the people i talked with would say you know it's it's very important to give aid, uh, food and money in emergency situations. Uh, you can't underestimate that. They need it now. People need it now. And it's also been very useful to give cash transfers to help lift people up from poverty. And interestingly, the most effective way is to give it just to the woman in the household. But we also need to replace that idea of just giving food and aid with revving up a local economy, with helping their private enterprise, with helping them have a robust community, helping the smallholder farmer have better crops and take her crops to market and get a fair price, and then helping uh, local communities create um, 
products, food products that are nutritious and sell those products and, you know, hire more employees. So we, we want to encourage private enterprise. We want to encourage flourishing communities. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's so important. Way. And again, another commonality we see uh, this has been something that actually has been pretty well covered uh, in, in the media over the last uh, few years in particular that we have these food deserts in urban areas uh, where folks uh, may live in a very highly populated part of, the, of a city but there, there's no grocery store, so they don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. They may have a lot of convenience stores with junk food, but not, uh, not the important nutritious uh, food that they need. Uh, Charmin, th there is also concern about things getting worse due to climate change. And your book draws this important connection between climate change and malnutrition. Let's talk briefly about that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, as, as, as someone who's written about nature and science so much as an environmentalist, that really was one of my focus. How is the goal of the humanitarian and the goal of the environmentalist aligned? Um, but one way to think about uh, the effect of climate change on malnutrition is to, is to go back to that family in Malawi, that smallholder farmer. So they're already familiar with the hunger season when their crops, uh, they've started to use up most of the crops from one season, the next season of crops isn't quite producing yet. And so they, they have a hungry time almost every year. But then imagine if those entire crops fail. Imagine when a crop fails because of drought or a crop fails because there's too much rain or too little rain or, or, or a cold snap, all that kind of erratic weather pattern we're seeing with climate change. Then they are really going hungry. And, and in a lot of these places, there isn't that much government help. What I, uh, you know, as you, as you look into this and uh, as you think and feel about it, it's really a moral crisis for us here in America. Uh, an average American produces 18 metric tons of carbon dioxide a year. That's our contribution to global warming. That's what we emit as an average. An average Malawian produces 0.1 metric ton. So 18 metric ton compared to 0.1 metric ton. So here we are um, creating uh, the problem and, and the people who contribute the least to it are, are suffering right now for it. So we, we really have to answer for that, I think. Absolutely. Well, I wanna move to this other topic that I think is very interesting. You talk about how hunger in childhood can lead to being overweight as an adult. How does that work? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so here in America, um, first I think when a child is food insecure, when you don't know when your next meal will be, and maybe it's at the end of the month when the bills are due, or maybe it's over the weekend and you're really looking forward to that school breakfast or that school lunch. I think that kind of insecurity about food might, might lead you to overcompensate, might lead to unhealthy patterns. Um, certainly what you said about the food desert. So if you live in a food desert in America and the access is to, is to fast food, which is cheap, it's convenient, it's, you know, it's highly processed, but it's not really very healthy. Um, and it's highly caloric as we know. So that might uh, make you gain weight. But for children all around the world, if you're malnourished in the womb, if you don't have the right vitamins and minerals as your brain and body is developing, um, you are becoming physically programmed to gain weight as an adult. So we've seen studies over and over they, from World War II on into refugees from Vietnam that children malnourished in the womb and in the first years of life are at much greater risk for overweight and obesity as adults. I have a lot more hope for the children of today, especially in the United States, because there uh, has been a growth in vegetarian and vegan products and information about uh, how healthy it is to focus your diet on fruits and vegetables. We also know that eating less meat is a way to combat climate change, something we talked about a moment ago. 
Let's talk about the impact of uh, more vegetarians, more vegans, and more pr uh, products uh, that are available, the diversity of products, to eat a uh, healthier in this way. Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Of course, you know, eating less meat, moving towards a more plant-rich diet uh, is going to have a big effect on mitigating global warming. It's it's going to reduce deforestation. Um, it's it's going to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. So that is always listed as one of the ways that we need to reduce, uh, you know, climate change. And then, of course, we also know that that it's so much healthier to eat more vegetables and fruits and to eat real food, you know, uh, plant food. So I will add the other perspective a little bit from the developing from a poor country. I remember so one third of the world's children don't get a diverse diet. Actually, being uh, in extreme poverty usually means a very monotonous diet. And, and in Malawi, a lot of the children are eating just a mush, a kind of a corn porridge that, that's traditional and, and that, that's available for the children. And I remember sitting in a social worker's uh, office and looking at a pie chart of, of food groups. And so vegetables important and fruit important and, and, and um, nuts important and all, you know, all the good food and a little sliver of animal products too, big pie chart of food groups. And I said, well, can can someone here who, when they live on less than a dollar a day can they afford a diverse diet this was a very robust malawian woman she said yes yes of course they can a family has an egg don't give that egg to the man don't take that egg to market give that egg to the child mm. so there's that as we have to consume less meat in 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 the wealthy countries the poor countries have to find every way they can to diversify their diet. Yeah. We all hope they don't make the same mistake we make to yeah. have this kind of obsessive um, excess of meat eating that, that really has gotten out of hand. Important way to end our, our program because you're absolutely, I think it's a good way to put it. it we are obsessed with, uh, with meat and unfortunately uh, an awful lot of junk food. So I wanted to get that question in. Sharman F. Russell, the book is within our grasp. Important work. Sharman, thank you for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for joining us this week. We hope you'll join us every weekday on KRWG Radio. We have all of the great news for you every weekday. It's morning edition from 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by here and now, noon to 2, and all things considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News, always online at krwg.org, and we'd love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We'll see you next time on Newsmakers.